Okay, well, um, before we dive in, I'd like to share just a few housekeeping notes. Um, first, uh, note that this session is being recorded and we'll distribute distribute the recording after the event. Um, if you have any questions for the speakers, please submit them using the Q&A tab on the right hand of your screen. Um, we do use a voting system here very democratically. So if you see a question that you like, just give it a thumbs up um, and uh, we'll make sure that your question gets answered. And because um, the questions with the most upvotes are the ones that are going to win. <laughs> and um, now we'll just get to our main event and we're going to introduce our guests, our speakers. We have Craig Plagiard, Vice President with Beekeeper Group, and Natalia Gonzalez, um, who is a Senior Account Manager with the Beekeeper Group. Um, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Julia. We appreciate uh, the partnership with Quorum, as always, and we appreciate you having us here today. Um, Beekeeper Group is a public affairs, a boutique public affairs firm based in Washington, D.C. Uh, I've been with the company for nine years now. Uh, we are uh, not a full service agency in the sense that uh, we can always find something uh, or someone can always find something that we wouldn't really do, but we primarily uh, focus on digital advocacy work for corporations, nonprofits, and trade associations. Uh, again, most of those are in Washington, D.C., but we've got clients all over the country, uh, and we have uh, a wonderful history of helping our clients succeed in public affairs, digital work, uh, design, websites, strategic ideation, uh, and so on. So. Uh, with that, Natalia, you'd like to say hello. Thank you, Craig. So I'm Natalia Gonzalez, as I said, Senior Account Manager. I've been at Beekeeper for five years um, and throughout my five years done a lot of story collection in, across industries. Prior to Beekeeper, I was in an advocacy organization focused on Medicare, so did a lot of story collections with seniors there. And then personally, I am a huge advocate of type 1 diabetes, and so I've been on the other side too. It's a topic that I'm really passionate about, and I'm excited to talk to you all today and answer all and any questions. All right. Uh, well, we've already got a couple of great questions here in the Q&A. Uh, the first one is, how do advocate stories impact change? Uh, we have been very lucky to be in partnership with the Congressional Management Foundation for many years and every year the Congressional Management Foundation has uh, really awesome data sets that comes out of a survey of congressional staff and members of Congress and uh, time and time again we have heard from CMF and, and from their survey that advocate stories are one of the most important things for moving the needle uh, in terms of policy. Putting a face to a policy issue, putting a name to a policy issue, uh, particularly if it can be tied to a constituent and a member of Congress or a senator's district or state uh, is super critical um, and really gets you beyond uh, lobbying and and the, the kind of bigger picture grassroots and really helps to complement a grass tops strategy. So uh, advocate stories are super important for those of you who are uh, also working in a development function or who might have colleagues who are working in a development function, uh, marketing or any other kind of fundraising. You'll also know that the stories of real life attendees of your events or people who benefit from your programs or who have received care uh, thanks to your programs and so on. Uh, it's, it's that real life, those real life examples that, that really humanize and put uh, an important emphasis on the work that you're doing. Yeah, I would add, I mean, stories help um, make complex information just relatable and easy to understand. And I, we were hearing from an, a former congressman a couple of weeks ago at our, at our summit and he said that truly like this legislators are hearing so many issues all the time. And so the stories that as Craig said are like the easiest way for them to remember and digest 
complex issues. You've got an awesome question. What are some best practices for collecting advocate stories? Uh, there are a number of different ways that you can collect advocate stories. Uh, I'm sure everyone is familiar with just uh, a text form online or uh, perhaps some folks who have been in the business for a while might have gone through postcards or other kind of physical mail. Uh, We've really been focusing over the last four years since the big shift to work from home caused by the COVID pandemic um, on digital storytelling and digital story collection. There are two uh, divergent paths for story collection that we've found to be most effective digitally. The first is the self-service model where we uh, or you build a form on a website that enables people to submit their story. There are a number of tools that allow you to add a, a way to capture video to allow people to record themselves. Um, and when we ask people to record themselves, we find that the one great best practice is to give them tips on how to do it so that you don't have someone who's standing in their backyard next to a highway where you can't understand a thing that they're saying. Uh, we've actually got in the documents tab here in Goldcast a very helpful uh, one-page sheet explaining, uh, providing some of those best practices. Uh, we also will provide those best practices on the webpage where we're doing it. Uh, the other way to collect stories has been through personal interviews. Um, there are a number of tools. Again, we really like a tool called Riverside that we have a license for that allows us to have a one-on-one -on -one or few-on-one -on -one conversation and record that conversation so that we get the audio and the video. We get uh, an AI-generated transcript of the video immediately after the recording has concluded. And an advantage of a tool like this over recording a meeting on Zoom or Microsoft Teams is that these tools will record the video locally to the person's computer. And then once you're done, it uploads their audio and video. So you're getting the most high quality audio and video that you can. Um, it is also very helpful to share uh, examples of what you're looking for. So if you're asking people to make a video, provide them with a video that you know uh, is great where you had an advocate or a member of your organization tell their story or get across the talking points that you want so that people can understand what you're asking them to do. Uh, a lot of people like myself are visual learners and it really helps to see an example uh, to kind of dispel some of the, the, the stage fright or, or, or blank page fright that someone might see when they're just presented with a text box and they're asked, what's your story? Yeah, I think to add one more best practice that often we kind of forget as we're planning hill days or events with our advocates or kind of whoever your advocate is in terms of if you have an event, like use that opportunity to really get their stories there. So whether that's, I mean, we talked about vir visual, virtual capturing, but in-person capturing is also kind of very powerful and then you can kind of reuse it a lot. And I know we'll talk about how to use those in the future. but. Um, but I would definitely think about also some ways pre-COVID that story collections were important, even if it is kind of knowing your audience and picking up the phone, calling your advocate, really capturing their story um, or letters. I've heard some organization theme, like I literally mail someone if they're in the case that they're seniors, they might probably prefer that than digital tools. So also keep that in mind. Your audience is super important when it comes to collecting their stories. And yeah. I think that's a, a great way to transition to Jenna's question. Jenna was asking, what are some ways to share stories with decision makers? Uh, Natalia was just talking about letters. We've conducted campaigns with our clients that have really strong grass tops champions or uh, other champions, and we'll interview them and 
help them distill what they're talking about into a letter that they will then share with their lawmakers. Uh, thank you to oh, the chat, buried your name, I'm so sorry. Uh, Patrick, who shared in the chat uh, at, when you were at uh, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, did I get that right for JDRF? Uh, you added uh, in an advocacy email uh, reports to officials where you are quoting people. Uh, that is really awesome to secure permission and to tell that story to uh, lawmakers. Yeah, and um, we will be sharing a link to the video tools that, that they mentioned. Um, so we'll follow up with that. Awesome. I, yeah. Um, what if any kinds of edits should we be considered? So in that document that Craig mentioned earlier, we talk a bit about editing there. And I think the most important part is having the call to action at least twice there, um, really show emotion. I personally don't love when you give an advocate a script. I think it needs to be very authentic. Um, but sometimes it, it can be kind of a, a bit of questions and, and process to get them to trust you and really get that story out. Um, I would kind of try the best as possible as you're capturing it to prepare the advocate for that. Um, but in terms of edits, just make sure that it has emotion. It's a straight call to action. Um, and you're Kind of there's some best practices on that document on like audio and visual and all of that you make sure that you really um the that you really start with the intention of what do you want the audience to retain after they watch that video and i think it's it's helpful to make it clear to your audience that you might edit the communication and that can just be like a a, a one sentence kind of fine print thing uh, just saying you know your, your message may be edited uh, we've all been there when you need to edit out some ums and uhs or uh, someone made a really good point, but then they kind of rambled and then they brought it home. Uh, I think it's usually okay to clip those. And especially if you're translating, if someone provided a video message where they recorded audio for you, I think it's usually okay um, without editorializing, but to, but, but to, but to quote that. Uh, and and I think folks are, are are pretty accustomed to seeing you know if it's if it's uh, verbatim or you're using you know brackets to make sure that they're filling in the right word and so on. Uh, yeah, and with decision makers, make sure that they're um, linking back to like they're a constituent, either what county or um, part of the state. That is also very helpful for them, so they can follow up. How do you begin a communications culture shift from output-based, like facts, figures, and statistics, to outcomes-based, like storytelling or impact? Uh, that is a very big picture question, isn't it? Uh, I, I think that thinking about, again, the, the there's a lot of synergy, and forgive me for using that word, but be, between facts and figures and statistics and the story, like Natalia was sharing earlier, uh, it's really the the, the people's faces and, and their stories that lend uh, authenticity and humanity to the facts and figures. So I think emphasizing the importance of uh, people are not just statistics. This is not just facts. These are real people. Uh, and if you are coming from an organization that has culture or, or sorry, that has had uh, a typical cultural emphasis on facts and figures, uh, incorporate that into the storytelling, incorporate that into uh, making sure in your talking points that people are saying, uh, you know, I am one of millions of people that this affects, or uh, I, I, I was a beneficiary because of the $5 million that the government appropriated to this program. Uh, give, give people, enable people to succeed in that way, and, and you'll be able to marry the two very well, I think. Yeah, I think if you use them together, people are more likely to remember the number 
So definitely don't look at them as silos, but really work with them together, whether it's a newsletter where you have both things at once or even in the same story of the advocate. And that's something your organization can provide to the advocate as a starter. Um, so, and to lawmakers, I know they always appreciate um, facts and research. Once you have stories collected, how can they best interact with data for the most impact? Uh, I I see this as sort of, uh, I'm envisioning a, a, an annual report almost where you've got a, a page, whether it's digital on the internet or it lives as a PDF or a printed document where, uh, again, humanizing or marrying the two, right? Having, having if, if somebody is talking about a program that affected people or uh, some other impact, uh, pulling a quote from a story or uh, even a, a, a screenshot from from a story or or embedding a video, uh, putting the two together uh, is is what I'm envisioning here, Alyssa. Yeah. Good one. You want to take this one? This is a good one. I think, um, well, first of all, social media is probably the best answer, like tagging your lawmakers and their staffers, um, sending it via email. Um, but uh, I think also think about it as a compliment to sending a letter or going to an in-district event and really making sure that you're promoted in front of their lawmakers, but also making sure that they receive it and that they remember it. And so sometimes through social media is a great way to just really depends on the lawmaker, how engaged they are, which is why, again, that who is your audience research is really important. And that way you can kind of know the best ways and to get them in front of their um, video stories. And then other ways you can do it as well is um, on the website, they are things that you can promote. And so if you are a resource to them, if your organization is something that is already kind of a, a thought leader that they know matters and they might go into your website and really look for that resource, whether it's a video fan or sometimes I know we've done like maps in different states and then you can see the advocate stories by state and things like that. So you can get creative in a way of where you share it, but that's a great question. And there are definitely many ways in which you can get your story out there. And I think when we're thinking about social media, don't discount paid social media as well, particularly LinkedIn, we found is a really good way to reach lawmakers. But uh, I know that there are you know, other ways to reach lawmakers and their staff using paid media, uh, particularly if you're partnering with companies that offer um, data uh, and then using those on um, display advertising or, or other ads that are managed usually through a, a demand side platform, uh, video ad tool, uh, and again, that gets back to the question earlier about editing together. Uh, perhaps you're going to create a, a brief montage of people talking about the issue, or um, you know that someone lives in Tallahassee, Florida, and so you're going to target uh, lawmakers uh, and their staff who represent that district uh, with someone in their, uh, in their district so that they're getting the, the perspective of a constituent. see we've got another great question uh, about I see. So, oh, go ahead. there you go yep about social media thanks nefertiti how can social media engage audiences to share advocacy stories uh, i think it's a great idea to include that as a regular call to action in your social media editorial calendar keeping it in the regular rotation uh, and again giving it the social proof of of, of sharing uh sharing another story sharing you know uh, here, here's what someone did. Wouldn't you like to be next? Uh, including that in if you're sharing out a video, uh, including a call to action at the end of the video. Uh, there might be multiple calls to action. One might be, you know, asking a lawmaker or policymaker to take action. Uh, another call to action might be uh, asking advocates to share their own story and to visit your story sharing platform. Uh, yeah, and I would say, like, if you have the resources, don't shy away from providing whether it's um, 
whether you have an advocacy ladder where you can provide kind of incentives for people to continue to share their story or there's an actual kind of price for sharing their story and promoting others to do the same. Um, I think don't be afraid of, of using those tactics as well to get um, that engagement. And I think we answered that yeah. one. Maybe we can this go one. to um, Veronica Miller. She asked how to combine personal stories with explainer videos and how effective that can be. I think there's, um, and again, it, it, you need to think about, and that's why you need to think about the storyboarding in a way, right? We don't want a scripted video, but we want to think about what is the goal of our message. And when it comes to complex issues, an explainer video tied with a personal story can be very effective. And so in that case, the editing might look differently because you want to do some animation with the story or you will need some B-roll around it. But I think it could be very kind of um, effective in a way of like, having somebody understand the complex issue and not just like understand the story. And so those two play together very well. And uh, an explainer video and an advocate story can be one and the same too. Uh, you can, you can have someone narrating the explainer video because they're, they're coming to it from a, a personal pr perspective. And also they happen to have a great voice for narration um, or uh, otherwise making bringing the perspective of someone to the forefront uh, while explaining the issue. Um, a trusted advocate who can better explain the policy nuance or so on, uh, who better for the explanation to come from than someone who's been uh, personally affected by your issue or policy. Yeah, and that reminds me of a video I saw, I think it was in the past Olympics, but it was somebody showing kind of the difference between the training facilities, women versus men. And so it was very powerful because she was telling her story as an athlete and was showing as an explainer, like this is a difference. And so you'll see that more and more common with a TikTok type of content. And so I, I think to Craig's point, it's very powerful when you can actually show to a lot of um, the stories and really interact with photos and, and other types of media versus just the advocate on screen. We have a question about the continued shift away from Twitter. So with the shift away from uh, X, the everything app, legislators still continue to use that as their main platform for engagement. How do you, how do we recommend engaging with and promoting stories on social media? Um, I think it's, it, it's interesting that we've seen the shift on the X's algorithm to prioritize video uh, and I would encourage continuing to experiment with using video. Uh, and again, like Natalia shared earlier, tagging lawmakers in video uh, or in posts rather on Twitter uh, to get their attention. Um, I, I do agree that X is still going to be where uh, the kind of the inside the beltway uh, media junkie type people are, are going to be paying attention. Uh, and, it, and it can often be a really good way to get the attention of uh, a communications director or a press secretary uh, who's, who's going to then tell their boss and the member of Congress or senator uh, or state legislator that, um, that they're receiving this kind of engagement. Uh, I think X also offers an interesting opportunity different from Facebook or LinkedIn or TikTok or Instagram. Uh, where you can coordinate a social media day of action and you can have many people using the tool to mention their lawmakers or uh, other policymaker uh, to share their stories uh, just in text because we've heard that it's usually uh, three, four, five, six mentions on the same topic is usually enough to get folks' attention when using Twitter. So. Uh, if they're getting dozens of personal stories from your members in a given day for a social media day of action, um, I think that's a really good way to, to break through the noise. Yeah, and there's a couple of um, questions here about kind of what you can do with limited budget. Um, there's one that talks specifically about, um, yeah, so I think in terms of, of budget, that's a good question. We've 
it depends on kind of what you're doing towards that. If you're doing paid efforts, organic efforts, I think the, the key here is the more content, the better, but also put out there the most effective to drive change, right? So you can collect as many as you want and polish the ones that you think are worth um, and will automatically like really impact change. And so that's usually how we approach it. And then also there's always um, kind of montage where you could do several advocate videos as one. And that is also a kind of very effective way of putting it out there in social media. Um, but I would definitely think through like, what is the goal in which of these stories are really highlighting it? And so I don't know if that means the polished videos, but the ones that kind of meet that and drive that change and are really kind of authentic and getting to the mission that you really want to achieve with your video campaign. And think about, um, I know there was an advertising question here on like what is a um, minimal budget to run an effective advocacy campaign. I, I think that's a tricky question, depends on kind of how many other Advertising campaigns are running at the same time. That is something that the algorithm usually favors, like depends on if your organization has multiple ads at the same time. Um, but I think don't be afraid to put some money behind it. The algorithm does um, prefer video content and you probably see it on Instagram, you see it on Facebook, you see it on TikTok. So definitely lean into using some budget. And if you do have other campaigns running and you are kind of a high spender or not, it regardless would help. I see success on like boosted posts just to even get more in front of people from your own page. So I would definitely think about that. Um, and each platform is different. So don't approach that necessarily the same in, in different platforms, but think about um, how you're spending and then how you can um, divide and conquer that budget. And, and always do organic social when at the same time as doing paid effort is what I would say as well. There's a great question here about, uh, from Zoe, how would you recommend executing a campaign when you need your audience to activate quickly, send letters quickly, launching with a short runway? Um, this is a great opportunity if you're using Quorum uh, to have most of uh, the information pre-filled in and then provide a space for an advocate to fill in their personal story. Um, you can add different messages into your rotation so that you are uh, giving different perspectives uh, or different relevant facts or figures and, and again, allowing people, uh, but really encouraging them when you're asking people, when you're sending them an email and on the page where they're being asked to take action, uh, really encouraging them, put in, put in a personal detail. Uh, share what this legislation would mean to you or what this policy is, how this policy would make a difference for you. Um, I think the the best way to get people's attention is to get them to understand what's in it for them, right? Uh, and that definitely carries through to uh, sending letters to their lawmakers and encouraging them to share their personal story. Uh, I think it would make people feel more bought in if you're asking them to share their perspective about why it matters. see what's the next question incentivizing there's this question about incentivizing and then we also have a question about um, compensation for storytelling uh, they're very interesting questions especially around compensation uh, i will first say i am not a lawyer uh, please consult your attorney or counsel for your organization to determine what is exactly permissible uh, when we think about incentivizing adding personal stories to an action alert template letter, I think, uh, I hope I, I just answered that when we talk about what's in it for me, uh, really speaking to your advocacy audience in a way that makes them feel the connection and, and want to share the connection that they have personally. And then when we think about dealing with the questions about uh, compensating people for their storytelling or for their participation, there are a number of non-monetary ways to compensate people. Uh, we've all participated or seen it at uh, advocacy events or trade shows or similar, uh, entering into a raffle. Uh, we all, many of us are operating uh, grassroots programs that have a ladder of engagement where you are incentivizing people to move up further. Um, Quorum has a really awesome gamification system 
where you can give people points. Uh, and I would certainly say that submitting a video story would be worth more uh, and shows more buy-in to your advocacy program than just taking a simple um, digital letter action uh, and, and clearly showing to people the path from uh, becoming just someone who's on the email list to becoming a champion who's willing to share, uh, who's willing to share their story. Sharing a story is also a really great way to weed out uh, or determine who your audience could be for inviting to an in-person event or to uh, scheduling a virtual meeting with their lawmakers and so on, because you do get that initial feeling, especially if it, they're doing video storytelling or you're interviewing them uh, for how good they can be on camera, how passionate they are about telling their story, uh, and just generally advances them along that kind of that 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 path to being a champion for you. There's a question here about how to avoid losing advocate stories in the shuffle of the day-to-day -day promotion. And I think that's where like the collecting part of it becomes really important, right? You want to document all these stories, um, whether, you know, quorum or anywhere that you track. Some organizations have a spreadsheet, nothing wrong with that. Um, if you have a tool where you can um, definitely kind of collect those stories that you have, those kind of interactions that you have with your advocates as well, so that you make sure that those stories are front and center. So if you are an organization that has multiple issues, you want to make sure that you document um, what the content you have on is. So whether it's a video or a written story, you want to make sure that you're taking the time to organize those tools in order to receive the story. So some of this is like pre-production um, type of work where you should really organize in the plan out how you want to collect these stories. Um, and then as you plan out strategic wise, think about these stories as the kind of pillar to your efforts and identify, as Fred was saying, champions that can really be the voice of these issues. And through incentives or things like that, I'm sure um, they'll just be top of mind. And so those that content will continue to be front and center in your organic, in your paid social, in events, um, if you do have um, hill days and things like that. So it's kind of, I would say, document what you have so you don't forget it and save those videos in folders, um, organize everything. I, I think it's the best way. And then that also helps if you have team shifts to have everybody kind of know the content you have as an organization and then pull that content out when you need it in a few years, let's say that you need to activate again on the same issue. And uh, organizing stories in a spreadsheet can be helpful also for approval processes. If you want your organization or you need multiple stakeholders within your organization to review a story, um, it's also helpful for tracking the process through review. Um, Dustin, I'm, I'm thinking of you when we think of um, advocacy story collection. Uh, I think that there that also speaks to another question that I saw here in the chat. Uh, about, let's see. I think I think I might have lost it here, but uh, that, that there was someone asking a similar question about. Um, uh, that's right. How do you verify the validity of an advocate story and, and make sure that they aren't engaging in hyperbole? Um, this again is a kind of a a question of your comfort level and, and your uh, your organization's culture and perhaps uh, legal um, comfort level. Uh, some folks know, you know, if, if you're going to be a surrogate for a, a political campaign, uh, even if you're going to be a big donor for a political campaign, there's often a vetting process. Uh, we all saw uh, this happen with uh, the vice presidential process. Uh, you could read all of those process stories and Politico and so on. Um, of course, we all know that we don't have the bandwidth or budget to to have a, a team of $500 an hour attorneys uh, dig into the background of every story uh, or every advocate rather that submits a story. But uh, there, there are a number of ways you can check people's social media, just make sure that they're uh, relatively normal person online, uh, that they're not uh, posting anything that would get them in trouble. Um, I think that also speaks to the question that I saw here. Someone asked about, uh, have we ever encountered uh, cyberbullying or other kind of negative reactions to stories? I can't personally speak to that. Uh, 
I know that some organizations here definitely deal with their fair share of detractors, um, and that can that can certainly be a little bit tough. Um, and I think that is up to you as the organization to let people know if they're going to be submitting stories, and especially if you're going to be using them, to let them know that you're going to be using their story online. And especially if, if you know you have a history in the past of seeing those detractors on social media, uh, just giving people a heads up that that they might be um, encountering some uh, a little bit of online negativity. Yeah, and I, I mean, a best practice that I always like to put in place when when I'm doing these big campaigns are, um, or small, it doesn't matter, having some pre-drafted responses. Most of those kind of cyber bullies are kind of not really talking about the advocate itself. Um, thankfully, a lot of these platforms, you can hide comments. So that's usually the approach I've taken when I've seen kind of a rude comment against an advocate. And then also those pre-drafted questions to really tie it back to like, this is why it matters. Um, Nefertiti asked about using advocacy stories from children. Um, absolutely. We have worked with the Children's Hospital Association in the past. They put on a really awesome event called Family Advocacy Day um, every year where they have children who are patients at children's hospitals and their families come to Washington, D.C. to talk with lawmakers. Uh, not to be too cynical about it, but I think a lawmaker uh, loves a good photo opportunity with a child, uh, particularly if that child um, is cute or if that child has some kind of uh, visible disability or vis visible medical condition. Um, advocacy stories from children are super effective in that context. Um, I think it also speaks to your particular issue, um, you know, it, if it makes sense. I certainly don't think that um, children would care much about, uh, you know, uh, cryptocurrency regulation, right? But if you're talking about uh, funding for pediatric cancer research or for pediatric diabetes or something like that, then um, I think you you want to put the the advocate the best advocate foot forward in terms of putting a, a face to the issue. Uh, I know that there may be some complexity around the use of children's likenesses on the internet. So again, that's where I would recommend um, engaging with, with legal counsel just to make sure that everything is okay with, if you're using uh, a minor. Oh, Natalia, you're uh, on mute. Thank you, that's embarrassing, it's 2024. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was talking about Grace's question here about um, how to work with independent state organizations. And I think um, one good way, I mean, to do it is really give them the tool. So you give them the blueprint on, on how do you do it nationally and really distribute that. And um, whether that means kind of giving them your uh, template of that spreadsheet or a way, you know, access to the tools that you use, but also giving them everything they need to execute and then becoming a resource for them, I think is very important. I'd also point to Canva here as a really powerful tool uh, for distributed organizations where you can create templates in Canva. Uh, I know that we're getting a little bit further away from storytelling here, but um, we've seen some organizations doing awesome work with enabling a lot of different people who don't have any kind of design background or experience. Um, really up until a couple of years ago, you needed to be a trained designer who had spent uh, hundreds of hours using Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop. Now, uh, thanks to Canva and some other online tools that allow for easy graphic design editing, you can have someone who knows what they're doing, who has the creative experience and training, they can create something that then someone who really just knows how to use a computer uh, can take that and run with it and, and, and personalize it. So I'm thinking here, particularly in the context of um, storytelling, uh, all sorts of quote cards for social media uh, or other templates that would enable you to just copy and paste in uh, your advocate story into a nice design where it doesn't require you to be um, you to be a designer. Yeah, and pro tip, lock your Canva graphic before you share that um, because, you know, the other teams might get very creative with your design and you don't want to <laughs> do that, right? Um, we had that issue last year. So always lock um, 
but give them the tools um, so that they don't have to, because a lot of cases, and Grace, I don't know if this is your case, different state organizations have different budgets. And so that's where it gets tricky to kind of execute the same campaign across. And so if you give them the tools, if you give them the design, if you give them kind of halfway through um, that, they can really um, execute really good campaigns in different budgets. And so I think that's important for sure. Thank you for that question. And I see a number of questions specific to quorum in here. So I'd love uh, Julia, if you'd like to bring a couple of those up. Yeah, so um, how can we use Quorum to keep story submissions organized? Yeah, so uh, within Quorum, we have a number of different campaign types within Grassroots, and it's really easy to find that within Advocate Data. Um, you, We have like a power uh, search and, and filter if you want to um, sift through um, each of the advocates on the types of campaigns they've taken action on and what those stories were. So for instance, we have like a share your story campaign where they would write in like their personal stories, which has been a big part of, of this webinar is really um, trying to get advocates to, to share those types of stories. And if they have, you would go to the advocate data set and filter for um, that sort of uh, that cherry story campaign because that was the action and that's where they would live. We'd be happy to set up lots of demos after after the call for, for Gorham Grassroots or um, for clients that are already on contact or CSM. Uh, how have others successfully used advocate stories to show the value of their advocacy programs? Don't, yeah. Is this for I, a forum specific or Natalia, you want to take this? I, yeah, I can take this. I think a good example, and I know Emma from NAMI is here that you can look up is NAMI.org um, and they have a, a kind of really nice way to successfully use advocate stories and and kind of use that as the main point within their advocacy programs and drive action and all of that. So I would definitely, um, I think, I mean, we've seen a lot of success on it. And so really leverage those to bring value, but also to increase recruitment, get more people motivated to really be the voice of the program and the issues. And I think by seeing other stories and putting other stories out there, you get more responses from others and that really want to engage in conversation. We all want to be a part of a community. So think about what you're building and what you want to build with your advocacy programs and really use those stories, use this, those champions to recruit other stories and, and make sure that they build their own relationship with lawmakers, which is um, kind of our goal here at the end, right? Um, and Craig, I know you've done other projects too, where kind of video collection has been a huge um, kind of messaging within it. Yeah, it, it's really important to, or really valuable to think about how you can extend that content once you have it. So we had a client where we collected stories and we put them on a website, very common, but then that client had the opportunity to present at a trade show where they had booth space and we had, um, a subtitled version of a compilation video of people sharing their advocacy stories playing on a loop in that booth space so that policymakers and staff who were wandering through the show could see them uh, without it being shared directly with them uh, to kind of reinforce the perspective of the other uh, communications that they were receiving. We could also send a link um, to um, a quorum blog that has some examples of effective um, grassroots. I'd seen one specifically to storytelling for the, the farm borough and that a, a lawmaker specifically called that advocate back who shared that story and, and spoke to them, which was a big win for them. That's awesome. That's a great case study. Uh, Julia, there was a question here, uh, another quorum specific question about what tools can help advocate, can, what tools can Quorum provide to help collect advocacy stories? 
Yeah, so kind of exactly what I said before, just because I had used that as, an, as, as a specific example of a share your story campaign. So when you go into Quorum Grassroots and you go to start to build a campaign, we have uh, a multitude of, of actions that, that you would want advocates to take uh, to pick from. Um, and one of them would be a, a share your story campaign where you're kind of creating your own action center. And, and that's where they would set, um, kind of just provide their first name, last name, um, and, and specifically the issues that they care about and, and share those personal stories. And then again, when you go in to uh, everything in, in Quorum is, is very organized and tagged and the reporting is super easy to, to get to and sifting through all these different kind of advocate data sets. And so um, if it, especially if it's tagged to an issue area, you could go back into Quorum, find that really easily, find their stories, and it's all very organized for you. Um, and there's also action centers where you can have some like videos live, but um, for the text share stories campaign, that's one that would be a best practice for collecting those advocate stories. And Julia, in terms of directly sharing a story onto social media, what, what does Quorum enable in terms of people to, to, to share right there to Twitter? Yeah, share, uh, it's still really heavy on, on Twitter and Facebook. Um, those are are like the easiest way to um, once you've taken an action and 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 to share, especially as we've seen shift go to mobile um, advocate. Uh, it's just hey, I I took this step and and share it with your friends on on Twitter or Facebook. But more and you can that. also. You can also set up instead of sending a letter, you can do a tweet your lawmaker campaign. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. But um, the the history in 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 grassroots uh, for for us the the big uh, campaign has been to write write your legislator campaigns. But I think the the, the tweet your lawmaker campaign is an interesting way uh, as as an answer to the person who was asking about uh, a social media day of action. Uh, because it doesn't require you to really log into the platform. Well, it, it literally requires you to log into the platform, but you don't have to be active on the platform. It's just you click the button, you're prompted to log in so that you're you're connecting uh, your handle and then it shares right there for you. Yeah, you can you can start a campaign within Quorum specifically that is post at somebody with on on X. Um, Awesome. And is there anything that you can share that's in the roadmap, Julia, for Quorum in terms of? Uh... Ooh, I don't know. Like, I feel like I'm under NDA or something. I, <laughs> I, um, I'm on the the CS team, client client facing, relationship building side of the house, um, and I I think I'd be stepping out of line if I started sharing our our roadmap. But um, I know that we have some really um, great things coming to um, Quorum Grassroots. And I would urge everybody to uh, reach out and set up a demo uh, and, or set up some time with their CSM and uh, have a business review and see what's, what's coming up. Um, one thing also to think about, I know we've gotten a lot of questions about this, but maybe not this one directly, is think about these stories as a multimedia approach. So you can either get that study written or on video. If you got it written, you can make a video out of it. If you had a video, you can make it a written out of it. You can get quotes, you can tweet on social, you can have a map with a quote from the video. You can do a 60 minute cut, 60 second cut, 10, 15 second cut. So like really think about like stories as like not a one off. Like we have this one video from an advocate it's just posted off there. And I know we've gotten a lot of questions on like, how do we continue to use them? And, and I think too, there's an anonymous question here about kind of what motivates, how can you motivate advocates on those kind of slower periods of time? And I think that's where you dig into some of the more exciting issues that you've been advocating in the past and pull from those stories to just, you know, help spread that message differently. And so I think that's really important and a good cost-effective way to continue using what you've already invested in collecting. 
And also when you're in, in response to this question about motivating advocates to share stories on, on drier topics like appropriation and, and legislation they may be passionate about, uh, I think that uh, when we're, when we're and, and for this question as well, uh, how do you how how to engage advocates on uh, things that are not super exciting? Uh, I, I again really like to think about what's in it for me um, and try to try to frame stories and, and a request for stories around uh, you know what how how will this impact you uh, if you're talking about appropriations? How can you pull out this one specific provision? will fund this program that will enable this exciting thing to happen or that will create these jobs or maintain these jobs or protect protect this industry or protect the country or uh, similar. Uh, I think it also goes back to your advocacy strategy and your public affairs strategy in terms of what is the message that you want to send to lawmakers and um, targeting specific lawmakers with specific messages. You might have people who are talking about uh, they're fiscally conservative, you know, uh, thanks to this appropriation, we were able to eliminate waste in this program. Uh, whereas if you're targeting a different uh, audience, you might be able to talk about, you know, thanks to this provision, we were able to keep libraries in the inner city open or um, whatever other uh, issue that might appeal to the, the, the decision makers. Thanks. Uh, and, and I then, think we answered, yeah, we, there's one from Andrea as well. If we want to answer that one, I know we have only a few more minutes. Yeah, a video release form definitely helps. Um, I think it can certainly be a deterrent. One way around that is to go back to people after they've film to just have a simple consent box when they submit a form if they're doing it online and then if you get a good story and you it's important that you get their consent you can go back to them um, and ask them and, and really say make it more personalized hey i really liked how in your story you talked about x y and z can we have your permission i'd love to use this quote from you let me know um, that is the best way that i can see to preventing um, we all know that the more fields that there are to fill out or the more clicks that you have to do, you're going to see drop off. So um, enabling someone to submit the story, especially if it's a video um, first and then following up after, I think might, might help reduce some of that fatigue. Yeah. And I think to avoid advocate fatigue, again, this is a kind of two-way street. Make sure that you're giving them as much as they're giving you. Um, and build that trust with them to really feel comfortable with sharing um, their story with you and keep a bank of different advocates so that you can really switch them up and, and know when you need to ask which advocate to do, be the champion for which issue. Don't expect to have one advocate talk about all of your issues because you know they're putting a lot of work into it. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you're giving them something in return. And so that's where some of these incentives come through, um, but also it could be as easy as like, let them know what's going on, right? Let them know the progress of the bill or um, any kind of useful information they might need on the topic because they, they, they're doing it out of passion, right? And so we need to remember that too. Michelle, this is a great question. Uh, an average budget is kind of tough to say uh, you some of these tools uh, can be done very inexpensive uh, or free. Uh, but then when you're thinking about particularly uh, the labor required, if you're capturing video, you're going to need to edit that video. If you're going to be promoting video um, or promoting stories, then then that's where you're getting into the thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, for amplifying your message. But um, I think on average, some it's, it's a pretty big range, but you know, maybe 
six to fifteen thousand dollars is probably a good earmark for uh, a good storytelling campaign uh, the, the the beginnings of one yeah and i know like there's no way to predict the viral moment i mean i know we love to say that the ice bucket challenge was a huge one where people were like i want that to happen and so i think that also ties back to like whoever you're engaging with whatever lawmaker shares your message whatever other kind of influencer type or, or you know person that has a lot of following shares that message then that's a totally different um ball game and we've seen that on TikTok where like advocate stories have you know, just been hugely successful because somebody reposted it with you know a million followers so i think just think about this in many ways and there's collecting the stories there's really like the organization of it then there's the or the way that our design team would like to put it pre-production production and then post-production think about those in all those ways and then how do you execute that what channels and all of that and so i think for a good storytelling campaign you need to think about all of that and then you can kind of do it either in a multi-year um way or like think about how you um divide your resources there so there's a lot of good things you can do and as craig was saying you really minimal budget to get your story out there and and hopefully you have the right person to amplify your message um with not too much to spend on it all right well thank you everybody for all of this engagement some really great questions and conversations and thank you natalia and craig for your for your expertise um time flies when you're having fun so we are um trying to be mindful of everybody's time so i think we're gonna start to to wrap up i want to thank everybody for for joining us today um again thank you to our speakers for for your time and expertise um clearly have a ton of experience um and it definitely echoes everything i've heard from from expert panels at advocacy advocacy conferences that i've personally attended so um as a reminder to everybody we will be distributing the recording in about on um, the next day or two so so keep an eye out for that um and craig or natalia if someone wants to learn more about beekeeper group where should they go yeah they can go to www.beekeepergroup.com um or also visit our social media at beekeeper group um, we also on that document that we linked have um, resources there on kind of more of what Craig was saying, what we do in, in our website. So feel free um, also reach out to us on LinkedIn as well if you have any other questions or we're happy to answer those. Great. Well, thank you everyone again for, for your time uh, today. And I think we're going to wrap up and I wish everybody uh, a great rest of your afternoon. And thanks again for joining and we'll see you soon.